No mai haere mai, ko Shannon Dowsing toko ingwa. Welcome to the Exchange Cafe. At the Exchange Cafe, we come together to share conversations and resources about climate solutions. We're fortunate <laughs> to have Dana Kirkpatrick in the studio with us today, the national candidate for the East Coast electorate in the upcoming 2023 general election. Today, we're focusing on the environment and climate change and your party's policies and how they'll impact Te Tarapiti. Mm -hmm. oh. Kia ora, first of all. Uh, welcome to the studio. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your um, local links to the community? Yeah, kia ora, Shannon. Thank you for having me and, and um, what a great thing the East Coast Exchange is and the work that it's doing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, look, I'm born and bred in Gisborne. Um, my, my grandmother, uh, Whakapapa, is Te Aitanga Mahaki uh, and uh, she was born and bred at Whatatutu and, uh, and my mother grew up at Te Rata Station at the top of Mount Arafona. Uh, so uh, I spent a bit of time up there as a child, and what a great, great place that is. My dad, uh, David Kirkpatrick, um, uh, was a farmer on the Poverty Bay Flats and, uh, and a rugby player and a polo player and all of those things. I think he played just about every sport known to man, tennis, basketball, whatever, you, whatever he could, he would have a go at. So born and bred here, went to Parate Primary School, grew up here. I've owned a business here. I've worked um, alongside many of the large organisations, the council, the uh, Trust Tarafiri, the others uh, in here, and I've managed um, a number of organisations here as well. So, yeah, long history in Gisborne, uh, and very proud to call Te Ranganui Akiwa my home, and, uh, and the place you always go back to is your home, isn't it? You're Te Ranganui and you just get back there and you feel safe and feel happy, and I very much do feel that way here. Wonderful. Well, yeah. it's great to have you in the region. It's wonderful to have you running, of course. Um, well, let's just dive straight into it because we've got <laughs> yeah. some hard questions to get through. Yeah. Uh, as you know, under the Paris Agreement, New Zealand has signed up to some really ambitious climate reduction targets. So far, we're looking unlikely to reach these. Uh, the, science is telling, the science is telling us we have six years left to at least half our emissions if we don't want to be caught in a runaway climate collapse. There's a high level of concern among New Zealanders, particularly rangatahi, uh, and calls for more urgent and effective action. What's your party's commitment to climate action and plans, and what plans do you have to half our emissions in the coming six years? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and it's a big issue um, that we've faced. Look, the National Party signed up to the Paris Accord and to um, you know, carbon net zero by 2050. Um, we also have a number of, of policies that relate specifically to climate change. Uh, but we don't think that the best way to achieve our reduction in emissions is by penalising our largest export sector, which is our agricultural sector. So we, we have a number of things we want to do along that way. So we have a, a few policies. We have a transport policy, we have a uh, agricultural emissions policy, um, and some work around electrifying uh, New Zealand or renewable energy. So all of those policies feed in to this. Um, in terms of agriculture, we want to work with the sector to, to reduce uh, the emissions. We know that we have to do that, uh, but we don't see uh, reducing production as the best way. We see investment in technology and uh, in things like gene editing, gene modification, to, to be able to deliver better uh, tools, I guess, for farmers to uh, reduce their emissions. So uh, that's one thing we'd like to do. An example I can give you is around the grass that was that was developed in New Zealand uh, that had 30 percent less uh, methane emissions once eaten by cows, dairy cows largely. Um, but because of the rules from the 1990s around gene editing or gene modification, we can't trial that grass in New Zealand. So we send it to California to be trialled and therefore we lose our IP, we lose our competitive advantage in that space and, and we don't, we're not able to grow it here. So we could reduce um, the methane emissions of cows by 30% or up to 30% if we just did um, something as simple as that. So that's one thing um, we want to look at. We also want to look at uh, um, doubling the amount of renewable energy uh, in New Zealand uh, in terms of wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, hydrogen, um, and, and how we invest in the infrastructure to deliver that. Uh, and also, and then in transport, things like um, public transport and rail links in the lower North Island, um, better roads with less emissions as a result, and in investing in electric, um, you know, the electric fleet, if you like, to make sure that it's a more um, 
I guess, more prominent in our, in our society and in our community. Yep. Great. Um, lots on the go then. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Tarapiti is vulnerable and being severely impacted by climate change and severe weather. Uh, <laughs> as you know, our lifelines, including roads, water, power, communications, were all cut off in a single event. What will your party do to support the Tarapiti region and prepare it for the impacts of climate change? Sure. Look, um, Cyclone Gabrielle uh, was a, a dreadful event for our community and you know, you'd get messages from, once we could work reconnected to the rest of the world, you'd get messages where people wondered whether we'd all just fallen off the side of the North Island and, and disappeared into the sea. But uh, that connectivity is a, is a major issue for us and it's one thing that we really need to be better at. So I think if we're going to be better at managing uh, in these kinds of situations, uh, we need to be better prepared. Um, but the National Party wants to focus on resilience and I know anybody you talk to on the East Coast is completely tired of that word, of being told they're resilient. They don't want to be resilient anymore. They, they just want to get on with it. Uh, so we want to focus on um, the, the building back better kind of approach where you know maybe we can't just fix the roads that we've got and the bridges we've got. Maybe we need to think differently about where we put those and how we build them. Um, maybe we need to think differently about uh, land use and, and what that looks like, and I'm sure we'll get into that in more detail. But, um, you know, I think whilst uh, we, National, the National Party would, is, is going to support the investment already given by the government, the current government, into recovery, um, we think that perhaps we just need to think about that and, and what that looks like. You know, the $6 billion didn't come with busloads of resource consent planners and civil engineers and people to actually supercharge the recovery. It came as uh, some dumps of money and then the community is being told to kind of get on with it. Um, so we're not, seeing, we're not seeing what we need as quickly as we would like. Um, the National Party has said it wants to speed up that process where it can um, but without compromising the long-term future for for what uh, our response might look like, and you know, roading and infrastructure. So, in terms of water, um, you know, our policy is to give the control of the water assets back to the councils, not to spend that money on bureaucracies like Three Waters, um, which is used to be four and is now ten um, entities. We think that money should we would be better going into the infrastructure to be upgraded in the communities that need it um, by the by the bodies that have been democratically elected to look after that. So some councils can't afford the, the investment, um, but we, we think that you know we should look at those and deal with that aspect rather than creating another layer of bureaucracy to deal with it. Okay. So the ministerial inquiry into land use laid <coughs> out a roadmap of recommendations uh, to address the immediate and long-term risks facing our region. Will you incorporate the the recommendations from the Outrage to Optimism report, and if so, which ones would you fast track? Yeah, the recommendations from the report were quite wide-reaching, and um, and some would term that some of them were out of scope for the report. So um, I have read the recommendations. Um, I've also read the Crown response to the recommendations, which is interesting, and and probably um, puts a fair number of them to the side for now. Um, and rightly, wrongly, or indifferently, you know, my focus for that ministerial inquiry is on is on what happened uh, in the cyclone and how we we prepare ourselves to not have to deal with that again in the future and what that looks like. So, in the in the conversations I've had around the community, you know, it's a very polarised um, topic. Uh, there are lots of different um, thoughts on it, and and every faction uh, or stakeholder group has a different, uh, I guess, reason to feel maligned and and not very happy. Um, in terms of the recommendations, I think you know the most important ones for us right now are uh, cleaning up what we've what we've got. Um, you know there is still a huge amount of of um, debris in forests and up roads and in river beds and all over the place that um, come the next storm uh, could end up in exactly the same situation. So you know I think the first priority, the short term priority, has to be in that. In the medium to longer term, definitely around um, how we invest into technology or research and development to find a financially sustainable way to clean up those sites quicker and easier, whether that's by 
um, you know, biofuel or chipping or some way that forests can be cleaned as they're moved through um, on the skid sites uh, would make a big difference. Um, but then also how we focus on uh, land use going forward and what that looks like in terms of forestry as, you know, pine trees or other types or is that a mix of forestry uh, uh, pine and, and natives or, or how do we how do we make the best of it because with all the best will in the world what happened after cyclone bowler was done with the best intentions uh, it just didn't it, no one foresaw what was going to happen with that and the technology and our science is so much better now that we can we can reach a better result by all working together and I guess that's my last thing is that I would really like um, all of those different stakeholder groups to sit around a table and find a place where they're all a little bit happy, not a little bit unhappy because I feel like uh, we're only going to be better at this if we do it together um, and that includes the council, the forestry companies, the you know the iwi, the communities that have been devastated by what's happened um, because largely they're employers and they're people as well that live in, in those communities that are employed there that own the businesses that cut the trees down and everyone needs to play a part in what goes forward but but we only do that better together. Um, with the wide ranging impacts on our community it's clear we need to transition towards a more sustainable economic future. What does your party see as a just transition for the region then? Look, we've got so many things that we need to focus on um, going into this into this next period. Uh, the just transition, I think, is outlined in the report, has a whole lot of things we should do um, around uh, education, around um, biodiversity, around business. Um, you know, we need to agree as a community what that looks like um, and how we do that. I think that if we're going to be told in a set of recommendations whether or not we should do these things, we, we need to have that conversation and make sure that that's what we're, we're all agreed on um, and, and how we're going to do that. But certainly, you know, let's, let's try and um, have some agreement around this inquiry and around what's, what the future holds. You know, what, what is the best course of action for us in terms of land use and, and roading and networks and, and business around forestry? Because we can't afford for the forestry industry to fall over completely in our region. It's a massive employer, it's a huge contributor to our regional um, economy, our regional GDP, if you like. Um, it services the port, which is largely solely a log trading entity. Um, and unless we can find uh, an agreed way forward for it. There's still 24 million tonnes of timber to come out of that forest. We need the industry. We need um, our region to recover. We have a massive issue around mental health and the psychosocial recovery, which hasn't been addressed by anybody. Um, lots of little groups doing great work, you know, Real Support Trust, Here For You, um, Toafi Men's Centre, lots of little groups doing great work in that mental health space, but no psychosocial uh, recovery system that actually pulls it together and says how are we going to deal with this as a community. So I think, I think we're still a wee way off, you know, how we, how we come out of this in a planned and managed way that means we can all get on with our lives. Uh, businesses are under increasing pressure to reduce their carbon footprint and their impact on the environment. Uh, how will your party support businesses to decarbonise? Oh well, um, the first thing that we need to do, and we've talked about this long and hard, is get this economy under control, uh, get it back up and running, and get our you know businesses back working and, and feeling positive, uh, because then they start to focus on on how they can transition into different ways of thinking and doing business. Um, we have uh, a focus on um, clean energy and, and electricity, so we would like to see businesses, uh, large business obviously, um, transitioning into clean energy rather than coal uh, or, or fuel. Um, so we want to really focus on that. Electrifying New Zealand is, is our policy that's around that, um, that sits around that. We want to make sure that we um, support you know, local initiatives around around um, transitioning, but certainly the transition for farming and agriculture is one of the biggest ones. So agriculture, farming and transport, you know, the big, the big thorny issues for us to, to find ways to do that. And, and so 
with farming, we're going to we've got a whole lot of projects that we want to kick off, um, and they re, re, uh, revolve around things like um, being able to um, use wetlands um, as a as a way to you know uh, reduce your carbon emissions. Also good for the environment, so you know a filtering cleaning system for rivers and waterways. Um, we want to do that, we want to think about that electrifying New Zealand, we want to think about more electric vehicles, uh, just, to, just better, more consistent ways of doing business that, that help um, people think differently about what they're doing. Great. Uh, we know that localised community based energy products are effective for cutting emissions uh, and increasing regional resilience is important as well. Uh, Sakon Gabriel demonstrated the urgent need for these local systems and successful trials in our remote communities have taken place. How will your party help remove the regulatory barriers and increase R&D into these community-based energy generation projects? Yeah, it's a great question because uh, there have been lots of trials and lots of you know projects that have been touted for our community in terms of wind farms and solar energy and, and others. Uh, so our plan around that is, is part of our Electrify New Zealand policy and it's, it really relates to reducing compliance um, and cutting with red tape because what we've seen is it can take up to eight years to get a consent for a wind farm and then two years to build the wind farm. So, so our com um, policy states we want to see uh, consents for renewable energy projects uh, within one year. Uh, so we want to see a 12-month period for that. If they can't do it in one year, there'd have to be a, a good reason why not. But there doesn't seem to be a reason. It just takes that long, you know. So uh, if we're going to double our renewable energy or our clean energy targets, uh, then we need to find ways to do that. So speeding up the compliance and the red tape is the big one. Um, so we can get more investment into those, those kinds of projects and get them up and running faster. You know, in our region, um, if you get cut off, as we did in Gabrielle, you get cut off and you're at the hands of everybody else and you've got no control over that. But if we had some ways in our community to keep um, electricity running, then, then why wouldn't we want to do that? You know, that makes perfect sense. And it reduces all of the fuel costs and all of the other things that are around it if we can do it ourselves. So, yeah, we would fully support the investment into those kinds of projects. Um. Power companies are making record profits while households are struggling to pay the bills. Uh, it was recently reported that the four biggest power companies had a combined earnings of $2.7 billion. What would your party do to accelerate the adoption of those cleaner energy options, such as wind and solar, and how would that actually benefit New Zealand households? So the report and the research will tell you that investment in clean electricity and, and doubling the supply, because we do have an undersupply of it right now, so if we double the, the production then we, can, um, then we can manage across New Zealand in that space, uh, that will push down the price of energy uh, and connections to, to the grid if you like, um, because we will have uh, a much more diversified way to, to create electricity. And so uh, that's, that's our big thing really, is just to get, um, get the electricity amount doubled, uh, make sure that we're using all sorts of our uh, other things we can, like the, the wind, the rain, the solar, the, the hydro energy, the hydrogen, geothermal, you know, I mean Gisborne or Eastland, um, our, our own company here, have invested in geothermal in Kawaro and in, around in other places, and, and we should be looking to support that and, and to try and because all of that drives the price down. Um, on top of that, you know, National will support the uh, winter energy payment for people um, because we see that as a barrier at the moment. But but if we did if we didn't have to do that, that would put more money back in that we could invest back into that system. Mm. Uh. We've committed to global methane pledge, which means we're needing to cut 50% of New Zealand's uh, net greenhouse emissions by 2030. What will your party do to support farmers to reduce uh, New Zealand's agricultural emissions profile? Yeah, well, I talked a little bit about this uh, previously, but our big push on this is to give farmers the tools to reduce their, their emissions. We don't believe in any way, shape or form that we can afford to just cut production from farming. Uh, it's our biggest export sector. It feeds 40 million people worldwide. And whilst on a global scale, that's not 
a huge number of people. It's significant for our country uh, and significant for our own, you know, um, economy. So uh, we need to support the rural economy. Uh, we need to find ways that we can do that and reduce their, their emissions sensibly uh, without losing production. So by using technology and by using um, changes in legislation around genetic modification, gene editing, we will unlock the potential to, to find ways for farmers to reduce their emissions without reducing production. Uh, so that's one of the big things for us. We really want to see that, that happen. We also want to uh, talk about uh, land use and what that looks like in terms of forestry and farming and the interrelatability of the two. Um, you know, we've seen a bit of a push over the last few years for um, forestry uh, to take over farming as the, I guess, as the panacea for, you know, uh, reducing our carbon emissions because we, we lose production and we grow carbon credits, essentially. Um, but that doesn't help us long term. And uh, so we're going to introduce a number of ways that uh, farmers, uh, some rules around what classes of land can be uh, put into forestry, uh, what percentage of classes of land can be put into forestry. But we're also going to push um, the pricing system out a bit further to 2030 so that we can have a really scientific base to that and take agriculture out of the ETS because in other countries, uh, agriculture wasn't in the ETS as a specific um, point. So we want to do all of those things, but in, and also um, we will uh, find a way that for any new plantings of native forestry or for wetland uh, construction or restorations, um, there will be ways to claim carbon credits on those too. So uh, I think Todd McClay's line is, if you can find a way to measure it, and we agree that that's, that stacks up, then that's absolutely a way for us to do that. So if you've got stands of trees you want to plant um, and you want to plant them in native, um, that's great. If you've got riparian plantings that will help um, you know, clean up our waterways but will also be able to claim credits on, then that's good too. Uh, so let's find ways that don't hinder our production, um, find ways to reduce the carbon emissions a different, different way. Yeah, I think you've, um, you've led beautifully into the, uh, the next question. Uh, I guess this, this region's an example for all of New Zealand uh, of the damage that planting monoculture pine can cause, whether it be for forestry or carbon um, farming. It's resulted in unprecedented amount of damage to our lands, our waterways mm. and our biodiversity here. How would you address the current ETS settings that financially incentivise the planting of monocultural pine over natives? Yeah, so um, in those land use um, um, I guess categories, uh, we've got um, some limitations. So there will be a moratorium on conversion to pine trees for land uses in, I think, classes one to five. Um, there will be some percentages of land uh, in classes, um, I think, five and six or something like that, that can be converted to forestry. And then in classes seven and eight, which are often the, the most tricky, um, you can plant forestry on those, but you'll have to figure out what is the best, uh, the best thing to plant there because, you know, as we've seen, big, heavy, old pine trees aren't often the answer. We did it with the best intentions, don't get me wrong, but um, we've discovered that perhaps that's not the best. And, and um, you know, the experts that I've spoken to have said you can't just plant natives because they take too long. Uh, to get going, so you have to intermix them for a little bit with some other species. Uh, you have to have a real focus on pest control uh, because that's a problem too, especially when they're you know completely deforested and we want to replant them. So there's a lot of work to be done in that space, but I think we could we could definitely work with uh, local organisations better to to find the solutions for those um, and how we how we plant uh, in a way that is going to be sustainable and right tree for the right place. Yeah. Great. Um, we're in a biodiversity crisis and our Tonga species are at risk. It's proving as important as the need to reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. um, would you support the development of a biodiversity credit system for New Zealand? Well, I've looked at uh, the work that's being done with the East Coast Exchange on the um, biodiversity credits and that credit system. It looks great. Uh, look, I can't say that we've got an actual policy on that right now, but it's certainly something that should be looked into. And 
uh, and, and why not if it's going to actually promote our own you know, biodiversity and look after our native Taonga, as you say, um, then we should be looking at that because what is New Zealand without its, without its actual real true heart? And, you know, in, a, in a region like this, where you have the Raukumara range right through the middle of it, um, we should be protecting that and looking after it. And, and on the fringes, which is where we do the farming, uh, then we should have a transition approach to that. But I think, you know, farmers these days understand that. They know that. We have a huge amount of Māori land here, um, hundreds of thousands of acres of Māori farmland that, that could be used um, in this space uh, if there was a way for them to you know, gain credit for that, um, then, then that's a good thing. You know, that should be, should be a, we should be open to that. Our waterways have become contaminated with uh, excess nitrates, silt, runoff from farms, slash from forestry. Uh, they're just no longer a safe place for us to enjoy or collect kai or fresh water. Um, what would your government do to restore the health of these waterways? So we have, uh, we would like to see some more work done in, um, and how we manage the waterways. Like I think, in all seriousness, and it's not, I'm not saying this flippantly, but uh, we don't do many of the things that were done to our waterways uh, in, many, in the years gone by. We don't um, you know, just use them as a way to get rid of waste and, and water um, issues like that. So, and farmers are very aware, theoretically, of, of what they need to do in terms of those riparian margins and making sure they plant them. Unfortunately, in our region, they plant them um, with all the best will in the world and fence them, and then a cyclone comes and the whole lot disappears again. So it's a very tricky, difficult you know, uh, conversation for some of them. Um, but they do want to see it, see it happen. They believe in the, um, the quality of our waterways. Uh, we've we've had a terrible time with the slash and and you know and the ruining of our you know freshwater ecosystems I think and, and particularly um, up the coast and uh, and we need to think better about that so so maybe the you know the focus on on forest um, of native species in some areas on riparian planting on wetlands as a filter and a ecosystem uh, will all make a make a difference. But uh, it's, it's a long-term fix, not a, you know, there's no short-term fix except for cleaning up those forests as much as we can right now. Um, look, it's been wonderful. Are there any final points you'd like to make uh, before we sign off about your party's commitment to protecting uh, and enhancing the environment? Look, I think as New Zealanders, we all know that, uh, that our environment is important to us. I get really upset when I drive along our roads and see rubbish all through the the ditches and the roads. You know, if we're that committed to the environment and to what we want to see as a clean, green New Zealand, we all have a part to play, and we should um, we shouldn't we shouldn't let that define us. You know, uh, the rubbish in the ditches and along the roadsides ends up in the rivers and the creeks and the sea, and um, and I, I just wish that amongst everything else, we made sure that we looked after um, our own. Uh, our own space as well. You know, I go and pick up all the rubbish along our roadside at, at home where I live, and it's appalling what people throw in the rubbish. So perhaps that's a little bit about um, affordability of, of waste um, disposal and affordability of, of recycling and how we, how we do a better job of that uh, as well, because whilst it might seem a little thing, um, it plays a big part in our psyche and our, our respect for, for our land and what we're going to do. So, you know, Along with all of the big picture items, I'd like to see some of that stuff uh, included as well. Great. Well, Namahi, it's been wonderful <laughs> speaking you. with you. Um, it's really great to have you here providing your knowledge and insights today. Uh, all the best for the campaign trail, obviously. It's a thankless task, and we appreciate having great candidates here running for us. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for coming in. No, oh, thanks for the opportunity, and um, I just hope the East Coast Exchange keeps up the great work that it's doing because it's it's a wonderful, um, wonderful entity and doing good work. So I fully support that. Perfect. Um, follow us and contribute to the Exchange Cafe at exchangecafe.co.nz because together we have the solutions. Matewa. Matewa.